Well, hello everyone. I'm Rashad Collins, the uh, CEO here at Neighbor Care Health. Uh, on behalf of our partners, uh, Meridian Center for Health, uh, Public Health Seattle and King County, and Valley Cities Behavioral Health, welcome you all. Uh, and we also, of course, want to welcome Senator Patty Murray. Yay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, as a strong supporter of community health, we are honored to have you, as well as other leaders, doing much needed work in our community. With that, I will turn it over to you. Well, Rashad, thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you to all of you. I'm really looking forward to this conversation and appreciate everybody who, who's here today. Um, we're here because I think we all know that our nation is facing a real crisis in mental health and substance use disorders and clinics like the one we're in are, and, and people like all of you um, are really important to our efforts to try and get our arms around this. So I really am looking forward to this conversation and really want to thank all of you for coming today and giving us your input. Um, I think we all know that the nation faced a mental health crisis before the pandemic but the pandemic really um, put it on the front page. And a anywhere I go, people, the f one of the first things, I don't care if I'm in a school, I'm at a business, I'm in the airport, people talk to me about this issue. So I wanted to come here today to really hear from all of you about what you're doing and uh, share a little bit about what we're doing at the national level um, so I can make sure that um, we are all working together on this effort. Um, I think we all know that our kids have been hit especially hard. I think that's probably the number one thing I hear from people. And that our hospitals and providers just don't have the space um, or the ability to deal with the, the surge that we are seeing. Um, and, and then, of course, we have opioids and fentanyl, and that has really um, increased both the pain and the heartache and all of the challenges that, that we see in every single community. So back in D.C., I have been really focused on this. Uh, last year, as chair of the HELP Committee, I worked in a, uh, on a bipartisan bill to really address a number of the issues that we're facing here and to do what we can to support our communities. Uh, and we put that with our spending bill. So the final bill we passed in December included both additional resources and some changes in policy and support for a number of the programs that uh, we yeah, I know all of you rely on. Um, and I was especially um, happy to see that we strengthened the 911, I mean, sorry, the 988, I'll say that, uh, lifeline, um, which I have been told has gotten over 2 million calls and texts already just since, since it's been introduced. Mm -hmm. So we know it's making a difference. And of course, working to uh, increase treatment for um, uh, disorder treatments and strengthen our healthcare workforce, which I hear from everyone. Um, a lot of support for a number of the programs that we have increased support. And as everyone here knows, um, working in my capacity on appropriations to make sure we, I provide specific resources uh, through the congressionally directed spending. And I'm delighted that we got funding for several projects that have been really key here that many of you have been working with me on. So it's a br very broad um, look at everything, but I wanted to specifically come here today as we head back into session next week. Um, as you know, I'll be chairing the Appropriations Committee, so I've got my ear on the ground for what all of you want me to really focus on in that bill. And uh, I think it's, so it's, I think it's really timely um, that I come listen to what is happening in, for each of you and uh, make sure I'm working closely with you. So again, thank you. Thank you to everyone for being here. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from what, uh, from all of you. And Rod, we'll start with you. And thanks, thanks for your great work on this. Thank you so much, Senator. I uh, really appreciate the invitation yeah. to join today and the opportunity to share with you some uh, kind of words from the front lines, if you yeah. will, uh, although I know that you're yeah, hearing them when being on the ground. Uh, my name is Rod Dombowski. I serve on the Metropolitan King County Council representing North Seattle, uh, including Senator Murray's old stomping grounds, uh, Bothell, uh, where her folks ran a five and dime store like my dad yeah. did down in yeah. camp where she spent time as a kid, uh, and also Shoreline uh, mm -hmm. is in my district. And uh, it's just great to have you here, uh, Senator Murray. Uh, particularly at our Northgate uh, Clinic, where we partner with Neighbor Care. Upstairs, we have our Women, Infants, and Children, our WIC uh, program, uh, where we get, deliver nutrition services, and uh, we'll even size you for a car seat uh, wow. and all that. 
Uh, we're joined by uh, the leader or manager of the program, Cal Peck. Cal, raise your hand. She's here. We had a great visit uh, earlier uh, and uh, got to hear a little bit about what's going on there. Well, it's a true honor to join you today, and thank you, uh, Senator, for bringing together these exceptional leaders to talk about behavioral health issues across our region. But I want to start with some thank yous to you first. Uh, you mentioned the pandemic. Uh, and your leadership, particularly from the appropriations uh, seat in the Senate, um, has just been instrumental in getting King County through the pandemic. The federal government sent King County during the course of the pandemic about $1.6 billion, $1.6 billion across several bills. And we used that money first to respond to the pandemic from a public health perspective. We prioritize it. <laughs> Second, to house people, then to feed people, and then a major investment in behavioral health because of the struggles there, and then economic recovery, and then investing in our criminal legal system and reforms there because that had a significant impact. But without that aid, uh, it would have been a disaster, more than it even was, Senator, and we could not have done it without the federal government's help. Just a few highlights from some of those priorities. We invested $11 million in just care. We're gonna hear more about that uh, novel and creative and successful program um, in terms of getting folks who are really struggling on the streets the care they need on an individualized basis. Um, we put $4 million into apprenticeship pathways in the behavioral health space. Mm -hmm. You mentioned worker training and the needs to address the challenges of that workforce, the folks who are on the front line. We wanted to, to develop some apprenticeship work there. We did that with some of the dollars you sent us. Uh, we also put $4 million to address social isolation and loneliness, focusing on young people and seniors, folks who are most vulnerable, we felt, in the space there for being isolated uh, and away from folks because of our responses. So thank you, Senator, for that tremendous investment, uh, the dollars you sent to us. We put it to good use, and we think it mitigated uh, the impacts. I want to talk about kind of two issues in the conversation we're highlighting today. Uh, the first is suicide prevention. You mentioned the 988 line, and we are standing up that here in the state. I know you care a great deal about that issue, and it's clear to any parent, myself included as a parent across our country, uh, that the pandemic exacerbated our existing mental health crisis. I was reading uh, some data here in the last couple of days that really in the last 10 years, even before the pandemic, the, the challenges in youth mental health have doubled in terms of visits to hospitals and need for care. And that started before the pandemic, but it was exacerbated because of the isolation right. uh, that you mentioned and that you're hearing about. I wrote along with the Shoreline Fire Department when mm -hmm. we were doing some of the early vaccinations and the chief there described firsthand the increases in suicides and in drug overdoses, largely related to just the, just the depression, sadness, loneliness, and isolation. Uh, in our young people. And so you are right to focus on that, and you're right when you're hearing folks. It's not just anecdotal. The statistics back it up, and we appreciate your significant leadership on the appropriations subcommittees to make more federal investments there. And we could use more. Uh, at the county, um, we work in partnership, as you know, with the federal and state government. In fact, the plaque out here in the building uh, has the four lead sponsors, uh, and that is the state, uh, the county, uh, the City of Seattle and the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. And I think that is an appropriate thing to keep in mind that we work in get together in partnership. Uh, the county has some local funds in mental health, our MID fund, Mental Illness and Drug Dependence, Drug Dependency Fund. It's a tenth of a penny sales tax. I think we spent about $80 million a year out of that. I ran an amendment uh, which was backed by the county council last year to put $5 million of emergency surge funding into youth mental health to help address this challenge locally. It's it's a big amount of money, but it's also a small drop in the bucket compared to the need, and so we could use more help there. Uh, the second issue beyond the, the suicide issue uh, is crisis care. Um, when someone is identified or comes forward with a behavioral health crisis, options are very limited, very limited as to where they can go. King County has one short-term behavioral crisis facility, one, for a county of 2.3 million people. It's voluntary with only 46 beds and it requires a referral from a hospital or first responder. Not only is 46 beds insufficient for a county this size, you can't simply walk in if you're in crisis. So we've got the barriers there. As you can imagine, the result of that is a crisis at our emergency rooms, the main front door for care. Um, and it's filling our hospitals and folks are not able to get the best care and the care they need uh, in that setting. The picture is only slightly better for those needing longer term residential care. 
Um, recently, through a collaboration with the state of Washington, we were able to preserve a 64-bed residential mental health care facility over here across the highway at Northgate uh, by making an investment to acquire that. It's known as Cascade Hall. Um, without that, the county would only have 180 beds for residents needing residential mental care, down from 355 just four years ago. And that's just the economics, you know, have put too much, so much pressure on that system that it's breaking. Uh, we wait an average of 44 days for a bed, and there's a lot that can go wrong in 44 days. So COVID has, ex has exacerbated this crisis, um, and it'll take partnerships with the state and you and the Senate to help respond to it. We appreciate that. Three specific asks, uh, Senator. First, as you're listening here, <laughs> mm -hmm, uh, since 1965, there's been a rule called the 16-bed IMD cap. Mm -hmm. I know you're an expert mm -hmm. on it. You hear a lot about it. Um, at the county, we are going to put forth, it looks like, a levy here in the spring to build five crisis care centers around the county, one focused on youth. And, um, you know, one of the challenges in building out the facilities for this is this 16-bed limit. NAMI has called it discriminatory. Uh, it's a barrier to entry. And uh, while sometimes waivers are offered under, for, you know, the Medicaid yeah. program, it would be helpful, Senator, to convene the folks that are interested in this and commence a process to see if we couldn't have more structural flexibility on that limit, if not eliminate it, uh, to be able to respond to this crisis with, the, with the, the facilities we need without that limitation. I think there was probably good intent, you know, when yeah. it was put in place so we don't mass institutionalize folks facing challenges. But the, but the response is, or the rule is so rigid that it creates a problem. So there's one ask. The second is we build out this crisis care network if our voters will fund it. Um, one of the major variables is uh, Medicaid reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And we are estimating that about 20% of our costs will be covered with our partners on Medicaid reimbursement. To the extent, and you've done a, a lot of work on this, we can have an increased reimbursement rate, that would be appreciated. And finally, uh, <laughs> Uh, this is for, for Cal, uh, just general increased investment in our public health system. You know, it was hollowed out yep. over the years, and when the pandemic hit, we didn't have the robust capacity that we really should have to respond. You've made a significant investment already in that, and I think there's more to do to make sure we continue to have a strong, robust public health system that we invest up front in young people so they do not uh, have have mental health challenges or behavioral ch health challenges downstream those early investments as you know as a champion for kids as the mom in tennis shoes mm -hmm. uh, are so important and we're proud to partner with you at king county on those investments and look forward to doing more of it um, you know your predecessor in the seat warren magnuson used to talk about what was fair 50 percent for washington and 50 yeah. percent for everybody else yeah, <laughs> we know you can't get that but we're really happy you're sitting there and we're looking forward to working Great. with you to solve these problems. Thank you so much, thank Senator. Thank you, thank you, Ray. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Sin Kaczarski. I am the medical director at the Public Defender Association. And in, thank you. I'm the medical director of the Public Defender Association, and in 2020, um, I helped to develop and implement um, the COLEAD program, which became the backbone of the Just Care program. Um, and right now, currently, I am also serving as the interim COLEAD director. And I'm accompanied here today with, uh, by my colleague, Shawana Gaylor, who is our clinical director for COLEAD and will be available for some questions um, after, if needed, regarding our program. Um, and I just wanted to take a minute and just also express my gratitude and say my thank yous. Um, so neighbor care, thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate it. Um, and name that as we stood up COLEAD and Just Care, neighbor care was a really great ally to us. Uh, we operated in, in the early pandemic days in, in an environment where we did not have access to services for people and neighbor care really came through and stepped up and thought through unique solutions for urgent care. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you and we really appreciate that partnership. Um, and Council Member Dembowski, I just also really wanted to express my gratitude to you. Mm -hmm. Um, specifically when it came to um, the way that you championed the use of some of the funds from 
the county's uh, COVID relief in order to address the um, community, in order to, to um, respond to with a community-led approach to the the issue that we were seeing with homelessness encampments and some of the behavioral health um, issues that that, can, that came out of that people who were living inside them were facing. Without you and your colleagues, Just Care would not have gotten off the ground. So I really appreciate that and thank you. Thank you. Um, and Senator Murray, um, deepest gratitude for you with regards to um, where we are now. So that was our beginnings, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so now here we are. Um, that you know that you have secured funds with the congressionally directed spending uh, for 2023 and last year we faced an absolute possibility that we would no longer be able to continue and that we might have to close and so now thanks to the combined contributions um, from the state of Washington the King County uh, Regional Homelessness Authority the city of Seattle and now you uh, Senator Murray we are able to stay open through this year and so that is really wonderful to be able to provide the services um, that we do so I just wanted to speak a little bit about Just Care um, and and who we are and what we do so Just Care was really um, designed as a response to a, a, a like an acutely felt need in our community um, to because of the the epidemic of people living unsheltered and the the acute impact that our communities feel from that for the people living in them and also for the communities surrounding them and specifically people living unsheltered in our homeless encampments are living in some of the most untenable circumstances, um, situations really not suitable for any human being, um, often in places where services can't reach them. Um, as we saw with the pandemic, it was really a stress test to our healthcare systems and our mental health, behavioral health services, and even more so, it showed us where we, where we need to focus, but especially affected people living in environments where they did not have access to technology or the internet, because as we all know, we all went online, right? Everybody went online, all of your healthcare became telehealth. So without access to those resources, people were really left to their own um, devices and when living in these circumstances we find that a lot of the folks who are there in that experience have untreated mental health uh, profound trauma histories many of whom use substances in order to cope and just to survive and so we often see um, that as we start to, as Just Care starts to do the outreach and do the work to get to know people, um, you know, we first have to get there and we have to work with them. And in doing that, we've really learned that in this novel model that we've created, um, that when the service is offered, really focus on individual dignity, people accept them. When lodging sites provide privacy, and safety people will come in and we have uh, case managers who provide intensive case management support they wrap services around folks in order to meet their needs and it allows people a chance for in the temporary lodging for stability and a stability that can allow someone to set their own goals and meet them and what we have found is that the majority of our participants have moved into permanent housing yeah. which yeah is, awesome. is a, just a phenomenal success um, and I could name so many other individual successes but I know I'm limited here to, to time um, so I yeah I just wanted to say that um, just care I think with the fact that we still have this epidemic of um, houselessness occurring and combining that with the opioid epidemic um, and the mental health crisis in our nation, um, Just Care has proven itself to be a really solid um, resource and solution. And so just once again, I just wanna say thank you yeah. for your commitment to focusing and prioritizing mental health care 
we really appreciate that. Um, and really directing conversations and resources into that. And, um, and allowing us at Just Care to you know, continue to do our work and continue to, to meet with people and, and you know, support them. Can I ask well. you, do you just yeah. basically do outreach to people? Do you actually provide housing? What's, what is your key? Yeah, so, and that, that's the novel approach. We realized that things being siloed didn't, doesn't work as well. So it's very wraparound. We have outreach where relationships are first built, which so takes some time. Yeah. Yeah. So outreach into Encampment Street, and then once the relationship is built, we do a by name list, which means we individualize determining where a good fit for someone is. We have temporary lodging sites for stability, so people then come inside. And then when they are in our temporary lodging, that's where we work with our intensive case management and help them access whatever it is individually that they need. Sometimes that can be um, legal services, health care, mental health care, um, um, MAT or other SUD services, um, family reunification, all, you know, the host of things. And through that stabilization, we connect them to permanent housing. Okay, how many people do you serve? Whew. <laughs> in totality, um, I'd have to look at the complete total yeah. numbers from beginning to now, but on average, um, we have the ability to have about 150 okay. at a time. Great, thank you. Really yeah, appreciate absolutely. It. Thank you. Good job. Hello. Uh, again, I'm Rashad Collins, CEO at Neighbor Care Health, um, and uh, Neighbor Care is a community health center that's been uh, in existence, serving Greater Seattle for more than 50 years. Uh, including 14 school-based health centers and multiple homeless programs. Uh, with our integration partners, Public Health, Seattle and King County, and Valley Cities Behavioral Health, uh, this building houses one of our larger clinics, uh, providing medical, dental, behavioral health, social work, midwifery, diabetes education, and substance use services. Senator Murray, I want to express deep gratitude for your longstanding commitment to community health centers and our patients. Uh, you're under, you understand that our true well-being can, can only be achieved by caring for the whole person. Uh, removing barriers to those services is uh, crucial and essential. Uh, again, you've illustrated today uh, with the funding that you've prioritized uh, for school-based health centers, behavioral health, investment in Medicaid, and more. Uh, neighbor care uh, nurses in our housing and street outreach team also work closely with REACH, uh, as Dr. Katarski mentioned. Uh, and we believe in the Just Care program and as a human-centered approach, and we are grateful for this program and partnership and all of your support and ensuring funding continues for this program. Uh, we also are celebrating one of the provisions in the omnibus package that will make it easier for medical um, providers to prescribe life-saving medications to help uh, people recover from opioid addiction. Uh, this change will help accelerate our work to increase low barrier substance use services across our system and our community. Uh, patients can get this care uh, with their trusted provider in their neighborhood clinics. We also appreciate that you recognize the difficulties community health centers face in staffing our health centers and our health care teams, uh, particularly for behavioral health. In our school-based health centers, for example, uh, mental health therapists often have caseloads plus wait lists while they have uh, while they continue to see an increase in anxiety, disordered eating, suicidal ideation in students. Uh, often positions remain difficult to fill uh, in school-based and across our primary care clinics. Uh, your leadership to stabilize funding this year for the loan repayment program uh, will help incentivize uh, providers to bring their skills to underserved communities. In 2023, though, this funding um, for the program is set to expire which can make filling these roles much more difficult. We know that providing health intervention for people uh, before they enter crisis is, is a way to support healing. To do that, we need to diversify and support our behavioral health workforce with loan repayment programs, reimbursement for wider range of care professionals, and career pathways for people who li with lived experience from communities of color. Lastly, this is a very critical year for community health centers across the country. Uh, as our mandatory funding, Section 330, which represents 70% of community health centers' base funding is set to expire in September. 
it has received bipartisan support over the years, but we never take that, we don't want to take that for granted. Yeah. Uh, we need a strong champion like you, Senator, to ensure that health centers like Neighbor Care continue to provide uh, the necessary care that everyone deserves and needs. Thank you again for being here today and for your tireless advocacy on behalf of families in Washington. Thank you, Rashad. How many people do you serve here? We serve, uh, we serve 60,000 patients for the total neighbor care network, which is 29 sites, 14 school-based, and we have health care for the homeless programs as well. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the Senator for, and your team for all uh, the work that you've done and attentiveness to the non-English speaking refugees, um, especially those who are in need of behavioral health. Thank you. Thank you for supporting funds for uh, our Ukrainian center where we could provide in the bigger range services to new arrived refugees. Uh, my name is Oleg Binda. I'm executive director of the Ukrainian Community Center that was founded back in 98 with a goal to help uh, new arrivals, refugees across the board, even though my name is Ukrainian, we've been working with all new arrival groups helping Somalis, Iraqis recently to establish their center. And the goal was to provide social, service, uh, social services. However, with it, providing services, we have seen the new needs arising within the immigrant refugee communities. So we expand our services first, became uh, immigration accredited agencies that we could provide at the appropriate level immigration services and later identify the silent issue within the refugee immigrant community, which is behavioral health. Uh, new arrivals, refugees, especially those who do not speak language, they experience a lot of issues, beginning from adjustment disorders, uh, anxiety, depression. Now with the new Ukrainian groups who's coming from the war zone, we see a lot of PTSD symptoms that has to be addressed. Um, the biggest issue is that even though they recognize that they have a mental health issue, they are not eager to request assistance and help even though such is present. And the reason of that is immediate basic needs. As Dr. Katarski stated, that we need services that are wrap around basic needs, basic immediate needs. Because even if someone recognize that or recognize that they couldn't sleep, they you know woke up at night with screaming, but having worried where how to provide food or shelter for the family, all those mental issues become secondary. So that's uh, how we provide services in, in uh, our office since we became licensed to provide behavioral health services since 2013 and our services is wrapped around basic immediate needs for the family. This way uh, you could build a rapport and a trust between the counselor and the client and be more effective in creating uh, plans, you know, setting goals and doable, reachable goals that client could follow it and you know, be satisfied. Another big aspect of providing services to non-speaking refugees, immigrant, is certainly bicultural, bilingual counselor that would open up you know, a, a channel of communication because there are many providers who are using interpreters and it's great that we have that ability, but still, uh, there is a big trust issue, especially for those who expect, who escape, uh, you know, zones of conflict, war zones. So trust is very, very critical to build in this relationship. And another um, issue that I'd like to raise today, uh, again, I'm not a 
I'm not a medical doctor, I'm, I'm a my counselor here, uh, but it's critical to have an open channel of communication between a um, mental health provider and healthcare provider. Because very often healthcare provider would treat, uh, let's say, high blood pressure without knowing that clients suffer from anxiety, from PTSD, is not gonna be effective. You know, blood pressure is gonna be jumping up and down, even taking medication. Same for the counselors. If counselor doesn't know diagnosis, uh, phys physical, physical diagnosis for the client, it's rather difficult to address mental health. So you'd like to have this uh, communication channel to be open that both medical provider and mental health provider would have access to clients' records, could discuss the treatment plan that would certainly help reaching the goal for well-being, for clients' well-being. So once again, I reiterate, thank you for securing funding for the Ukrainian Community Center because uh, our funding is very limited. Uh, we have some Medicaid funding, uh, some funding from the state refugee program, but it's certainly not enough, especially now considering the huge influx of Ukrainian refugees from the war zone, and which Washington State, I believe, is the fifth largest in the country of resettling new arrived refugees from Ukraine, and Seattle King County area is the fourth largest in the nationwide. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, Senator. So, how many people do you serve now compared to like three or four years ago? Well, uh, our caseload uh, went up this year roughly on 300%. Wow. And that's, uh, you know, when we talk in immigration, even more. Uh, mental health is rather difficult, as I stated, because it's not a priority for new arrival right now. But we seeing a lot of clients in our office who need mental health. And when we offer them in polite, you know, we have to find the right approach. First of all, you have to consider that uh, Ukrainians, um, in their history, uh, they've been abused by mental health system. We're talking about, you know, former Soviet Union. So they don't trust it. Mm. You know, so we, you have to find the right approach as we present our program as emotional support not a mental health. Mm. And then wrapping it around the basic needs, you know, it, it opens up the, the channel to introduce to mental health, educate about mental health by removing stigma that they have. And, you know, then certainly, you know, success clients that become the peer, peers in our program, you know, they bring more clients into the program. And, and need is, again, tremendous uh, one, one example when we received a referral from the school uh, for uh, one teenager when there was a fire drill at the school. Mm. You know, everybody's supposed to leave the premises and that teenager just disappeared. No. Yeah. Been looking for over three hours and the reason is, surely it was associated with a war siren in, in, in her home city. Mm. Wow. Things we don't think about. Okay. Thank you. Well, great. Well, uh, this has been awesome. Does anybody want to add anything in particular about what's most important moving forward that we should be focused on? Rod, you gave me some directions. <laughs> I don't know about direction <laughs> requests. <laughs> requests. <laughs> the specifics. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. What are your overall goals uh, now chairing this committee instead of the health committee, the Veterans Affairs Committee, that you have in the past? Uh, well, I will tell you, on appropriations, you oversee all spending. So, you know, what, what we know in our community here is the same everywhere. Housing, mental health, um, obviously a number of issues that are the entire country is facing. This is one of the top issues that um, people talk to me about. And of course, we have Washington State issues like salmon that we're, are just there that I will hanford those kind of things that, that I'll be overseeing. But um, I really want to work with local officials here in Washington State to hear what their priorities are. 
Um, it's going to be a challenge working through appropriations at the federal level with the House and Senate this year, but I am determined and I have good partners with a lot of people talking to me. I'm ready to go, so getting my priorities set now is, is what I'm focused on. You mentioned it's going to be a challenge. Obviously, the Republicans control the House. You know, most of the time, tax budget stuff starts there. So how, how difficult do you anticipate these negotiations to be? Well, I expect that we'll make really good progress in the Senate. I've already been working and talking with my Republican counterpart, Susan Collins, on how we can work together. I have a number of members on both sides of the aisle who want us to get down and get to work. I expect that those same people are in the House. Um, they, they understand that the investments we make from the federal level make a huge difference at the local level, just like I do. Um, so you may hear a lot of steam blowing right now, but I'll tell you when we get down to it and people realize that's funding for their communities, I believe we can get this done. Any comments on the back and forth over the debt ceiling? Oh, th this is not new. <laughs> uh, we hear it every time. Look, the debt ceiling is basically we pay our bills, just like every family member who uh, puts things on a credit card, you pay your bills and there's consequences if you don't. Consequences for the country are a major economic crash. No one wants to be responsible for that. Just like every time we've worked our way through it and I'm certain we will again this time. All right. And that will conclude the formal yeah. portion of today's. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Look forward to working with all of you.